Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 948 for May 12, 2022. This is our happy hour live episode for the week featuring my conversation the other night with whiskey writers Nino Kilgar Marchetti of the Whiskey Wash and Kyle Swartz of Beverage Dynamics Magazine, along with photographer Ernie Button. His new book, The Art of Whiskey, features some amazing close-up photos of whiskeys in the glass, and they resemble planets, constellations, and all sorts of life. It gives new meaning to whiskey's role as the water of life. Thanks, as always, to our presenting sponsors of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast and Dewars, along with the segment sponsors each week on our flagship WhiskeyCast podcast, Scarabus, Writer's Tears, Mortlock, Catoctin Creek, The Dalmore, and Sagamore Spirit. Gentlemen, how are you all doing today? Doing great. Doing well. Doing well. Thanks. And Greg Serafian is already saying this should be great because he's a painter and whiskey lover. And Greg's email er, messaging in from Paris. Chris Ratcliffe, good evening, everyone. Matt, Crump the Cast, Cole, Howdy, and everybody. I have some Aberlauer Abuna in my glass. And uh, Nino, what do you have? I am drinking. It came out a couple years ago. It's a Heaven Hill 27-year-old bourbon. Was from the, some of the last existing stock they had from uh, before the fire, all those years ago. So, kind of was looking over what was left from some review samples, and I was like, "Hey, this looks like a good one to enjoy as we're going through this uh, podcast together." So, Kyle, what do you have? Well, it's not quite twenty-seven years old, but I have a uh, Maker's Mark pick that I help pick for the uh, Facebook group that I run in Connecticut, Connecticut Bourbon and Whiskey Enthusiasts, where the primary. Uh, Facebook group for Connecticut fans in Connecticut and kind of throughout New England as well. And we just released a Maker's Mark pick and uh, pretty well received so far. It tastes like peanut butter. And Ernie, I know you're drinking water because you're out in Arizona and you can never drink enough water in Arizona. Yep. Got to stay hydrated. Let's talk about this book and your career in photography with uh, whiskey specifically. These are amazing images. How did you come up with this technique so many years ago? Well, the the project started, you know, quite accidentally. Um, My wife and I have been fans of Scotch whiskey for a number of decades, and we were enjoying a dram one night, and the glasses were left out. And when I went to collect the glasses to put them in the dishwasher, um, I noticed this fine pattern, this charcoal-like pattern in the bottom of the glass. And when I held it up to the light... I noticed these really fine lines in the bottom of the glass. Because I had been working on a a project, a painter friend of mine had collected agates, which are rocks with moss and inclusions in them. Um, I had already had my studio set up for close-up photography, macro photography. And so, you know, when I got the time, I took the glass into the studio and just started shooting a few uh, images. At the time, I was shooting exclusively on film, so it, it wasn't that instant feedback. I had to wait a week or two to get the film processed. But when I got the results back, I was really shocked and surprised at how beautiful they were. And that set me off on this path, this journey, roughly 15 years ago. And we're showing what the Abuna that's in my glass might look like if I had your setup and your eye for uh, photography, what it might look like tomorrow morning. Tell us about this image. So when we started, or when I started this photography project, and when we started getting into single malt scotch, Abunar was significantly less expensive. It was like in the $40, $45 range for a bottle. And, you know, if you're a fan of the Abunar, you know that it's more than doubled in price. And so we were drinking a lot of that, number one, because it was an amazing whiskey, but number two, the price point for um, a young and um, up and coming couple, you know. So there's a lot of images created with uh, Avalar, partially because of that, but partially because it gave me such amazing images. Do some whiskeys give better images than others? Absolutely. And, and what I've found through the, the decades of working on this is that anything that's exclusively an ex-bourbon barrel cask produces fabulous images. 
I was telling you earlier that the Glenfiddich XX, which is mostly bourbon barrels, um, produces some of the most fantastic images. And there's quite a few XX images in the book, um, some that have been seen before, some that haven't been seen before. Um, once you start to add in finishing casks or heavily sherried casks, you can still see a rhythmic pattern, but the lines become less less precise. They're, they're a bit more diffuse. Still some wonderful patterns, but uh, the Macallan, you know, famous for their sherry casks, really have less specific lines. So this is purely about the image. It's, it's not about taste. And we have a question for you from Chris Ratcliffe. And without giving up any secrets, what kind of setup do you use to uh, get these photos to pull the colors out? So to pull the colors out, I've got a series of lights that I use different colored gels in front of. So if you just photograph it with a um, middle temperature light, because light comes in uh, more warm, more cool light, um, but if it's kind of in the middle, it's going to be kind of grayish yellow. So to get in those pinks and those blues and those reds, I'm adding those in in camera I, and you know, I'm holding up gels to the light. So this, you know, that's adding in a little bit of a blue filter with a little bit of uh, white light coming in from the lower right-hand corner. So at the top, you can see a little bit of reflection. You know, at the top left part, you can see the, the white light reflecting with a little bit of the yellow light uh, more toward the 12 o'clock position. These look almost like images you'd expect to see out of the Hubble Space Telescope at times. Absolutely. And that was a huge inspiration. I ended up uh, looking at a lot of Hubble Telescope images, which really pushed my photography forward when I wanted to learn how to turn them into planets. You know, I've got a whole Whiskey Planet series that uh, I've done a little bit of Photoshop to kind of bend them into spheres. But um, by and large, these aren't really Photoshop. You know, Photoshop is kind of the generic term for using some type of photo application on your turn on your computer. I use Photoshop for color correction, for spotting, for sharpening the image, you know, little technical things like that. But really, I'm not doing a lot of bending or, or you know, transporting lines to make the image. Most of it is in camera. And not doing distortion filters or anything like that to create the lines. No, no. The the lines that you're seeing are the lines that the, the whiskey is giving me. We'll come back to you in just a minute, Ernie. Kyle, Absolutely. what have you been working on these days? Uh, so we, uh, the company I work for, we do trade magazines, um, including one that covers the distribution tier of the industry. I just interviewed the executive team over at Breakthrough uh, to talk about some of their expansions recently. Uh, they uh, recently launched a large uh, e-commerce uh, business to business platform called Breakthrough Now. Uh, they doubled down on fine wine recently. They feel like the wine industry is moving more towards premiumization when it comes to millennial and Gen Z drinkers. They see them trading up in wine. Uh, so we talked a lot about that. I also, uh, Beverage Dynamics, the primary magazine that I'm an editor of, we covered the retail uh, alcohol industry. And so I recently interviewed uh, Gary and his son, Mike Fish, over at Gary's uh, fine wine and spirits or fine wine and marketplace. Apologies if I got that wrong. Um, I, I, Gary is one of the um, first uh, real, real um, innovators when it comes to bringing uh, fine European wines into uh, the East Coast in America and has been one of the leading retailers on the East Coast or out of New Jersey for many, many decades. Uh, and so it was a pleasure to talk with Gary and Mike. In fact, my magazine is naming them Retailer of the Year. Uh, and that's why we interviewed them. So they're going to be the cover uh, shoot and cover feature for our next issue. You know, what have you guys at the uh, wash been working on? You know, we're continuing to just do reviews, reviews, reviews. It's a constant, like, stream of bottles coming in to just, like, write about. I mean, you know, Mark, you and I have had the chance to watch this industry just grow in leaps and bounds over the years. And, I mean, it's just so much stuff out there right now just trying to keep a handle on what's good and what's not and talking about it and, and, you know, sharing it with our readers has been quite the journey. Um, we're also getting ready to launch a barrel pick program for our followers. It's kind of something we've been kind of just quietly working on for a bit. 
I surveyed our readers a while ago to say, hey, what kind of brands are you guys interested in getting barrel picks from? And uh, got that feedback and been chatting with some of the brands, barrel pick processes, and we're kind of starting to move through those now. And is as much as possible, we will be having the barrel picks done in conjunction with our review team, which is a strong component of our website and something that our readerships really come to trust over the years. I'm curious, how do you do barrel picks while maintaining the editorial integrity of your review process? It becomes a bit of a firewall. So we will look at the barrels and go through each process as it stands. And then we will provide unbiased commentary on how we feel about the picks are that we've put out there. And then we float it out there to our readership to decide whether it's something they're interested in taking part in or not. That's one of the things that I've always been a little nervous about doing barrel picks for whiskey cast, just for that very reason that uh, it's kind of hard to separate church and state when it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. That's very true. It's a process that we've been carefully looking at as we go through this in terms of how to make sure that the picks we choose are something we feel will represent the best taste profiles of our reviewer team and also be something that our readership is interested in. So what have you guys tasted lately that impressed you? We'll start with you, Nino. In terms of like what's come across our desks recently? Or what have you just tasted on your own? Boy, that's a good question. You know, I have been um, enjoying a range of things. I've got like the stuff that we review, and then I've just got a big old cabinet of stuff that I pull out random things from. Um, you know, I've been enjoying some Bryn lately. Um, I'm getting ready to do a French whiskey dinner here in Portland, Oregon. Later this month, I've teamed up with a local French bistro and we're going to be highlighting a couple of uh, French whiskey brands. And so I've just kind of been tasting through some of that and learning across the process. So Armoric has been something I've been trying, the steel, um, you know, some of the other French whiskey brands that are out there. It's really an interesting niche category that's emerged from France in the last handful of years. I mean, they've been doing whiskey probably less recently than others. You know, it, it's not a category that's super old, but I mean, they've got some very fascinating stuff coming out from that particular area. And of course, they've got a lot of experience with distilling brandy and other things. Totally. So. And I yeah. think one of the things that's really fascinating with that is the ability to take those whiskeys and age them or do second maturation in like French wine and French brandy casks. It's really like created some fascinating products from there. Kyle, what have you tasted lately that impressed you on the whiskey scene? So I also get sent a million samples constantly. And so I just picking a couple of things off the floor here in my basement that say, no, I get too many whiskey samples. Um, I thought the Jack Daniels bonded that recently came up mm -hmm. was a solid pour. I really enjoyed that. I thought it was very well put together, uh, very well balanced. And I'll tell you a surprise whiskey that I really liked. I'm not always a huge fan of when uh, the craft breweries start distilling their beers into whiskeys. I, I feel like that's more of a miss than it is a hit, but I'll tell you that the dragon's milk, um, from uh, New Holland Brewery uh, hmm. whiskey. It came together very well. It was a nice, uh, sweet whiskey, easy drinking. I opened this up with a bunch of friends who are whiskey fans. Everybody liked it. I thought that was a winner recently as well. If I could jump in real quick on the subject of single barrel picks as well. Like I said, I run a, a Facebook group where we do a lot of picks. I think we've done eight or nine now. And just to throw my two cents in, you're talking about the separation of church and state. You know, you really have to refuse a lot of samples. Uh, when you're going through picks, I mean, for every whiskey we do, we probably refuse six or seven. The maker's mark we just did, I think it was the first pick we launched in five or six months. We, we just couldn't find anything that aligned with what we liked and what we thought our <laughs> followers liked. So it's it's definitely about, you know, finding the right uh, whiskey and not just putting something out there to put it out there. And uh, pal, Greg Serafi in, in uh, France says uh, 82 distilleries making whiskey in France now. Mm-hmm. And the, right, it's such a small like thing. I mean, it's but you know, there's a lot of interesting innovation going on there. Ernie, what have you tr tried lately that impressed you? You know, we had the good fortune of returning to Scotland in March. You know, after being away for three years, and so our, our eyes were definitely bigger than our stomachs. But uh, we were introduced to the Fetter Cairn Distillery. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Never had it, never heard of it before. 
Uh, it was one of those duty-free pickups. Wonderful whiskey, the Federcairn 12. Um, so we're really pleased with that pickup. Um, I'm working on this project. Um, whether you love or hate the ideas of NFTs and selling whiskey as NFTs, um, there's a company called Metacask that's selling barrels of whiskey. Mm -hmm. And I'm creating images from those casks that are being sold and they're being packaged. Um, and one of the end um, uh, barrels that they're going to sell is a Springbank 30. Mm. And I, I've had a little taste of that. And that was pretty amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, the I'm not a fan of NFTs, but uh, explain to our listeners and viewers what those are, because mm -hmm. I, I'm still, <laughs> I, I, I have an abbrevi a different ab abbreviation for NFT and uh, no time with an F word in the middle. You sure is how I feel about them. Sure. But go ahead. And, you know, it's supposed to be something that lives on the internet, but, you know, selling whiskeys through NFTs and the blockchain has really kind of complicated that pure line of thought. Mm -hmm. And I know some people hate the idea of selling whiskey on the blockchain. Some people love it. Um, there's this company called Block Bar that recently did an, uh, mm -hmm. an art bag. And now they're being flipped for ridiculous prices. Mm -hmm. So um, if it, NFT stands for non-fungible token. And in, in theory, it's supposed to live on the internet and you have this, this virtual um, image that you can own, whether it's a single one of one image or a series of a hundred, you know, in that particular image. And so it, it uses a lot of computer power for certain um, cryptocurrencies and other cryptocurrencies they're, they're becoming more environmentally friendly. So lots of problems with it. Um, I totally get that. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to jump in. Mm. My, my stuff can live on the internet, whereas the, the whiskey, you do have to collect it at some point. We've done some reporting on NFTs, just interviewing some folks that are producing those things and doing some new stories on them and our readership has been very much like split yeah. on it. It, it. It's a very fascinating concept, but a lot of people are very like turned off by it as well. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to see where this is going to continue to go. Cause it's definitely, as you said, it's something that's taking off in like, you know, those sectors, but I mean, how does it approach, you know, we already have enough issues in the industry with the whole like second market collectibles Absolutely. situations going on and you know does nft ultimately just throw another giant you know kerosene lantern into that already burning fire i gotta have to wonder on that well and with that new Arbeg release the answer is yes i mean mm -hmm. one was going for like 2.3 million which mm -hmm. i don't know how many ethereum that was but you know that whiskey you want to enjoy it Mm -hmm. You want to celebrate it with, with friends and you don't, I don't want it to sit on a shelf mm -hmm. and, or, and that's what that's going to do. Or worse, have a beanie baby that represents this bottle that's in a safe <laughs> at our bag somewhere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I that can't, you may never go ahead. I was gonna say, I can't speak for the, what the value of NFTs will be long term. Uh, but I mean, in my opinion, it just seems like it's digital artwork and, you know, people buy real life artwork. Why wouldn't they buy digital artwork? It makes sense to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, and for the the person consuming the artwork, it's absolutely their prerogative if if they can get it virtually, that's cool. And as as an artist, you know, it gives a little bit of money on the back end, which secondary sales, tertiary sales, artists have never been able to collect that. You know, so if a Picasso gets sold at auction for fifty three million, obviously Picasso's dead, but if he were alive, he's not getting any of that. And with the NFT, it's set up to give the artist or the originator a little piece of that. So, you know, it, it does help with the artist's plight. I'd be curious in the comment stream, I'm just kind of watching that from my interface here, how many whiskey cast folk are actually familiar with, with what this even is? 
I mean, you know, like I said, we do a lot of reporting on it and we've all probably interviewed one or more people on it at some point, but it's so on like the far edge of what the whiskey space is about, you know, how many like guys that log in to read something or pick, grab a bottle somewhere, even consider it. I mean, it, this is really just such a bubble that's exploding in this space. Well, I know that, uh, for instance, our pal Chris Ratcliffe, who is watching tonight from uh, the UK, did a piece for us on blockchain last year in which he explained the whole system behind blockchain and how it works and how it uh, affects the uh, how it can affect whiskey in terms of being uh, authenticated. But mm-hmm. that was uh, sort of before the whole NFT thing came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is very and, big. With, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, it's bigger with the younger generations, too. So I wonder if this is another way to kind of attract, now obviously LDA uh, is what I'm talking about now. I'm not talking about underage people, but maybe another way to attract uh, more younger drinkers into whiskey. Hmm. Or attract, new, yeah, just attract more newcomers into whiskey altogether. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Makes sense. Well, this brings up the whole secondary market issue. And I, looking through my inbox today, I'm looking at, Two major auctions next week alone on Tuesday, one in New York that might, uh, that at Sotheby's on Tuesday, that's going to have over a thousand different lots of Scotch whiskeys available. Mm -hmm. Another one that uh, I think Bonhams is doing in Paris on Tuesday as well. Uh, Then Bonhams has one coming up on the 20th in Hong Kong. McTeers has its auctions. And these things, just keep bringing in more and more money. They're talking this uh, auction that Sotheby's might bring in close to $2 million alone just for whiskeys in one day. Wasn't Have we one... gone nuts in this world or what? <laughs> wasn't there another one that just, I think I feel like I saw a oh, news release on it the other day. Wasn't there like one that's another American whiskey auction as well where they've yeah. got like a one of the really rare super rare van winkle alternatives that is supposed to price for like i couldn't even begin to phantom i mean it's like i i love the idea of you know you have something you have the ability to do what you want to with it and sell it and what have you but that being said, the, the the price points that some of these secondary market bottles command these days is just like in the stratosphere. But but is know. bourbon really that expensive compared to scotch in the secondary market? I mean, I, I feel like bourbon might actually have some catching up to do in value. And I'm not trying to say it, that I support the sky high values. But when you look at how much scotch goes for in the secondary market versus what bourbon goes for in the secondary market, and then you compare the quality of the two, we're talking mm-hmm. about the same quality, but scotch still goes for a higher price point. Uh, I think than bourbon. I, I honestly think you're going to see bourbon prices continue to rise on the secondary market. I think it depends on where your marketplace is. I have observed through watching like secondary market auctions go on, like there's a real hot demand for anything older American whiskey in American markets. Like, you know, because obviously the, the bulk of the folks that are going to the American whiskey sites for auctions are looking for stuff that they're super familiar with bourbon, whatever. Um, scotch is definitely, I think in the American whiskey auction space stake that share as well. But then you see a lot of the huge prices for the, the scotch whiskey stuff appearing on the auction markets in the UK. But like, I mean, my observations just been on some of the sites where they mix and match that the American whiskey stuff is just like beating the scotch, whiskey in terms of like volume of bids and price per whatever. But no, that being said, I think like Scotch whiskey in terms of age and value is definitely way up there. And in some cases, probably overpriced as well. I would agree with that. I also think it depends on the part of the country you're in, Um, you know, here on the East coast, and I'm very much plugged in the secondary market. I'm not a member of Mm -hmm. it, but I'm friends with every single flipper in Connecticut. And I I follow (laughs) uh, their uh, markets very closely where they're illegally run online. And I see the prices going up, 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 up. And then we, I have friends when they travel around the country, I, I won't name what state, but one of my buddies just traveled to a control state where he saw, for instance, a bottle of E.H. Taylor barrel proof sitting on the shelf for 60 bucks. That's a $600 mm-hmm. bottle on the secondary market. I mean, yep. he bought as many as they would allow him to buy. 
and they brought him home and you know what he's going to do with them what he's going to do with them so parts mm-hmm. of the country haven't quite caught up but boy if no. you're if you're on the east coast or i imagine elsewhere in the country where market is hot you know the, the bourbon market in the east coast is red hot right now and the flippers are doing just fine i feel like one of the the dirty secrets in the buying something that resell in the secondary market is being in control states because control states don't typically have the incentive to jack the price on a bottle like you'll see in states where it's all private retail, right? And so, in many of those states, they're not allowed to by law. They're right, right. They're allowed no to only mark it up no a certain law. percentage over the yeah. manufacturer over their wholesale price. Yeah, Pe- no. people love to malign the control states, but I've been telling people for ages: if you want to find whiskey at an affordable price, go to a control state. Now, all of that being said, you know, a fair number of the states have caught on to some extent. So now they're doing these like auctions for the, not auctions, but like raffles Raffles. for the right to like buy a bottle or whatever. But when you look at the rules of the raffle, they're all clearly saying there, if we catch you reselling this bottle on some auction site, we are going to come down on you super hard. Because it's illegal. Yeah. It's illegal, but are they actually looking? And I'm telling, I'm asking that rhetorically because I don't think they are. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it depends on the state. Like some, they states do in are, Pennsylvania. Some states are really. It, it's really interesting. Some of the control states are really dialed into understanding how to take what they have and promote it well and keep track of what's going on and what's coming into their states. And other control states are like, yeah, what? I don't know. <laughs> I could certainly name uh, uh, control states that are like that. We we mm-hmm. do also have a, a niche publication in my industry, uh, excuse me, my company, Stateways Magazine, where there's a magazine for control states. And you're right, there is a vast difference for how the control states handle their allocated products and how they handle the secondary markets internally. Mm-hmm. Okay, Kyle. So who's doing it uh, the right way that benefits the consumers? I, you know, I don't want to start calling out who's doing it the bad way, but I, you know, like you said, I think Pennsylvania is a tremendously well-run control state. I think New Hampshire is a tremendously well-run control state. Um, I'm trying to think of any others that really jump. Uh, Virginia, I think, is a tremendously well-run control state. But that said, I mean, I, I, as somebody who's very much plugged into the secondary market and friends with all these people and follow this very closely, uh, none of them are getting in trouble. None of them are getting um, tagged by anybody. It is a complete wild, wild west out there. I see no punishments whatsoever. I, I have friends who go around, they visit 12, 13 bottle shops a day. It's like, it's like my mother antiquing when I was growing up, they would go visit 13 shops and buy bottles at five of them. And then they'd flip them for 200% profit the next day or the next couple of days. And and, today, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, the problem is a lot of businesses, uh, some have caught on. And that's why you do see the retailers starting to jack the price up at the museum stores, as we call them, where you go in, you look at the price and you keep moving because the price is so high. Um, Mm -hmm. But some stores have not caught on yet and they're just being taken advantage of. You know, here in Connecticut, I won't name the business, but a certain restaurant did a single barrel pick E.H. Taylor. And they were, I mean, they were selling it on the pricier side, but it wasn't a limit per customer. So, I mean, I went in, I bought my one bottle. I enjoyed it. I'm friends with the flippers. I told the flippers Mm -hmm. and they went in and they bought 12 each and nobody stopped them. And finally, the store, you know, clued into what was happening and made it one each. But these people are just, you know, cleaning out these businesses when they don't know what they're sure. doing. The businesses need to have a better understanding of who these people are. Makes sense. Well, if somebody comes in and wants to buy 12 bottles of a product, I can see a restaurant saying, great, that's 12 bottles we can get rid of on the spot and make a nice profit. And then they're not going to care whether they get flipped or not. But then those bottles also aren't going to get into the hands of, their customers on a regular basis. That's exactly what happened. What the restaurant should have done is limit one per customer. And I also thought if you buy it, you also have to buy a gift card. I thought if you're going to buy it, you also have to buy a $50 gift card. I thought that was more mm-hmm. fair and that brings back more customers. Cause you're right. They were just looking to get rid of bottles. That's exactly what it was. Um, but then, you know, to what end do those bottles help end up benefiting the business? You're right. There's mm-hmm. there definitely ways to do it where it's more fair to your customers and more beneficial to your business. Now, Tyrone Cote is in Toronto right now getting ready to board a flight to Ireland. And his comment, if you want a good look into how foolish whiskey pricing can be, I just walked into the duty-free shop and saw numerous $5,000 bottles that are younger than my favorite pair of socks. Global travel retail. That is a whole other animal. Oh, oh yeah. It, it, stu- it stuns me. Like, I, you know, we, we see the press releases like you do, Mark, on, on some of these things. 
and like it stuns me some of the stuff that's released this is a global market exclusive and it's totally being designed i feel like as eye candy for the rich and famous passing through oh yeah somewhere in europe or the middle east or asia and it's like oh look at that whatever brand for this price and it's this and that i'm just gonna take a bottle and i don't know take it home on the plane with me which seems really i just dropped fifteen thousand dollars on a bottle of this and i'm gonna throw it in my carry-on luggage okay and hope that i don't have any problems with security on my next layover right yes and kyle i could just i can hear lou bryson's head exploding when you said pennsylvania liquor (laughs) control board was doing well because lou's a Longtime critic, and Crump is in Virginia, and as a Virginian, he hates the Virginia oh. ABC. Didn't Virginia Tell him how good he has it compared to other control. I states, know so. the control state people, and Lou is somebody I'm friendly with as well. God bless Lou, one of the all-time great whiskey and beer writers mm-hmm. uh, that we've ever had. Yeah, famous critic of the um, control state there. No, but then come come move to Connecticut and try buying any of those bottles because you just won't see them. The only the bottles that you can buy on the control state shelves, the the, the highly allocated products. The only way to get them in Connecticut is through the secondary market to pay three times their retail, or you have to be such good friends with the retailer that they'll sell you it out of the back room. A lot of the time, these barrels don't, these bottles don't even make it to the retail shelf. Control state people, listen, I know control states aren't perfect, but I do think they have it better than private state people. Ernie, I want to bring you into this discussion from the <laughs> consumer point of view, and you knew I was going to do this. I just Because you're a normal person just buying whiskey at retail. What's yep. your take on all this when you go out shopping? It's been very frustrating as a person that drinks their bottles. Mm. When we started this whiskey journey, you know, we the luxury um, whiskey for us was like a Glenlivet 12. You know, and as our incomes grew, you know, and we got more settled, we could afford like a $100 bottle. Um, when I started this whiskey journey, the Balvenny 30, which was kind of that that bottle behind the case where you'd like kind of lust after it, it was six fifty, and now it's like 1200, 1300, just a decade later. Mm. So it's priced it out of the people that are loving the, the product. Um, I understand that flipping is, can be easy. It can be lucrative money, but whiskey should be enjoyed. It should be enjoyed the, from who consumes it with friends, you know, uh, instead of just being all about the money. So we have a question for you, Ernie, from Pete Head. Yeah. Um, on the photos, have you done experiments with colored whiskey, or to put it differently, can you see from a picture if E150A caramel mm, coloring has been added to a whiskey? I've always wondered that, but I've never gotten a company to admit that I'm using coloring. So I don't know. I'm assuming that because it is an additive, it's going to give me something different to the pattern as well as the image. Is there a way you can maybe team up with a scientist somewhere and maybe find a way to do analysis that would determine? That? I've always, yes, there there is. Um, I've always been leery of doing a chemical analysis because for me, that kind of breaks the mystery of what's mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I definitely want to know what's happening. So if, you know, I'm not getting a pattern from this particular whiskey, but I am getting a pattern from this particular whiskey, why? You know, and it it will come down to chemical analysis. Interesting. Um, You know, I've been, uh, during the pandemic, I've been experimenting with some rice-based whiskey. Mm -hmm. And because it's using a different grain, um, I'm getting these wonderful organic patterns instead of, the rhythmic lines you're seeing in Scotch whiskey, which uses a barley. And this one that Mark is showing is an Ardbeg. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that nice rhythmic pattern going over the top. Um, And you don't get that with a rice-based whiskey. So leading back to your question, I need to do a chemical analysis to see what truly is the difference between the solution that is made out of barley compared with the solution that's made out of rice. Mm -hmm. Now, I switched over to the Ardbeg 10 because you had this photo, as we showed, and there's a big difference between this one and the Aberlauer Abuna that I started yes. out with, obviously, both in the glass and in terms of the photography. Yeah. Tell us about this image. 
The Ardbeg? Yes. Oh, the Ardbeg. Yeah, peated whiskeys typically are a bit more difficult to work with because of that extra added element of the, the peat smoke. And so with this, um, this was kind of a surprise because, you know, Ardbeg being peated, you're still seeing that rhythmic, consistent pattern being formed. Whereas other peated whiskeys, it's much more diffuse. Uh, the lines that you, nice rhythmic lines you're seeing at the top, they, they would be more blurred. You'd see that repetition, but it wouldn't be as clear and distinct. You know, that to me looks like Ardbeg. That looks like the soul of an Ardbeg whiskey to me. <laughs> it's like Isla then, whiskey has come alive and is then my enticing job is us done. into the screen. <laughs> and uh, Greg Serafian suggests, uh, has a tip for you, Ernie. Look for German market bottles because they're required by law to mention if they have uh, even oh, 50 coloring. If it says yeah. mit Farbstadt or Stark Farbstoff, on the label, then it has caramel coloring in it. Okay. Ernie, That's a good I'm tip. curious. Is there yeah. a dream whiskey you would want to do this with? As far as someone that I'd want to partner with? or More like, you know, you've done this photography with these different whiskeys, right? Yeah, yeah. Is there a dream whiskey out there, like something that's ancient or something that's super niche or something that's just whatever that you would just love to be able to aim your lens at? For the longest time, I wondered what something like a 40 or 50 year old would produce. Mm -hmm. um, seems sacrilegious to, you know, dry even a drop of a 50 year old, but it's like, I'm doing it for the science. Of course. And, and so um, in what, I think it was 2019, we were invited to a special Balvenie partner, uh, party where they drew... Um, a bottle of 51 year old scotch whiskey. And uh, the person that knew me knew what I did. And so whatever was left over, I got to walk home with. Nice. And so, you know, I was of course, super excited, number one, to taste and have, but number two, to experiment with a, a few drops. And, you know, that was a, a dream moving forward. Um, or that I was a dream, you know, um, uh, up until that time. But as far as what I would want to work with now, I'm not quite sure, you know, because I, I, I'm waiting for that next, um, that next thing to kind of pull me and grab me. You know, like I said, rice whiskey is really intriguing to me right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm open. I'm constantly looking for something that, potentially could produce something new. Um, Glenn Fittick has this wonderful cask in their warehouse that it, they were experimenting with some authentic Japanese oak, oak that was grown in Japan. And I was able to walk home with a little sample of that. And that produced just some amazing patterns. Um, so I, I've really been fortunate to experiment with things that I, I've dreamt about. So I got to find some new dreams. <laughs> and as yes, Greg points out, it is always for science. Always for science, of course. It's always for science and then the leftovers are for whatever. Well, and the beauty part of this project is, you know, when I started getting notoriety for this project, people thought I was like wasting like lots of whiskey to do this. And really you drink the glass, you know, and you tilt it upside down, let whatever drops left go into your mouth, there's still enough residue in the glass to be able to form these patterns. I've found the sweet spot, sweet spot which is like two to four drops, really, of whiskey. And that's all you need to produce what I'm producing. So it's a really, really tiny amount. The rest is for enjoyment. And the type of glassware you're using matters in this, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, if I had started out with the Glen Cairn glass, I would not have found this project. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the design of the Glen Cairn, it's pulling everything to the bottom exactly to that one point. We started out with, you know, the conventional tumbler or the rocks glass, you know, with a flat bottom. And that's the only way that I exactly what you're drinking. Um, that's the only reason why I found this project is because it was drawing on that that flat bottom glass. 
as Mark's inbox starts to fill with stuff from Glen Cairn. <laughs> oh, well, no. Glen Cairn does make some flat bottom glasses, and I've experimented with those. And, and they've made some wonderful patterns, and they're great to drink out of. But the conventional, what we know to be as the Glen Cairn, mm -hmm. doesn't work for this project. Because it, it has that for, reverse punt in the, uh, that collects everything down at the bottom. Exactly. Which makes great for, it's great for shooting through the, uh, mm -hmm. shooting through the side, but it, distor it distorts it. Plus they've also got, usually got engraving on the bottom of some kind with yeah. the Glencairn logo. So. So could you do an experiment where you just, I mean, there's so many whiskey. I mean, Mark, I'm sure you could do a whole whiskey cast episode on just all the different types of glasses that have emerged from producers now, but. Could you maybe do like a photography experiment at some point with the different types of whiskey glasses that have come out from different producers and just see? Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. To, to see what they do. Um, you know, the bottom of a whiskey glass is not always level. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, um, you know, if it's slanted even at a little bit, it's all going to collect it at that uh, lowest point. So that's that's been a challenge for me mm -hmm. is to figure out how to, if it is not level, how to get it as level as possible. We have but a yes. question from Chris Ratcliffe. He wants to know if you've tried other spirits like rum or cognac. You mentioned in the book that you tried white spirits at the start, and that didn't work too well. Yeah. But what yeah, about rum I, and cognac? When I started this uh, project 15 years ago, there really wasn't the the plethora of aged um, aged spirits like there is now. Um, I didn't even know there was a thing such as aged gin or yellow gin. Um, and so when I started this project, I, I did my due diligence and I tried tequila and I tried uh, rum and um, I tried gin. The only thing that gave me close to that pattern was rum, you know, because it is aged in a cast, a cask. Um, cognac doesn't work because of the, the, it's based out of the grape or, or the wine. And so um, it really needs to be some type of cereal, a barley, a rice, something like that. And so when I went back like over a decade later to look at more of the aged uh, spirits, I was really surprised that a lot of them were producing interesting images. Um, I even tried the, uh, I think it's called Cristalano uh, Tequila. Um, and that I had to finesse that I had to heat it up. So it dry a little bit more quickly, but that produced some really nice patterns. So yes, to answer your question, if the secret sauce is really aging in an oak cask, if it's aged in any type of oak cask or wood, it's usually going to produce it. Um, except if it's a wine based product. So finishing casks don't always work then. Finishing casks can definitely distort the initial product. Um, you know, cognac, I've been surprised, really doesn't impact the, the pattern that much. But um, the more that they experiment with these finishing casks and length of time, that's going to change the pattern. You know, you showed, I think you showed um, the difference between the Glenfiddich experimental cask and the, yep, the, the winter storm. Winter Storm was the, the ice wine. And so underneath there in the bed, you can see a little bit of that pattern. But on top of it is the effects of the, the wine influencing that finished product. Whereas the experimental cask, that was that Japanese oak whiskey that I was telling you about. And um, you can see the wonderful patterns that are, you know, going to that center dot, but you get to see the rhythmic patterns building. Whereas the winter storm, much more diffuse. And Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, how much of these patterns are res residue or particulate that haven't been mechanically or chill filtered out of the whiskey? I'm assuming pretty much all of it, right? Well, most of the whiskeys that I'm dealing with are, are non-chill filtered, or that's what the label is saying. So, um, I'm not sure. And Greg Serafian, how about doing a book about legs and tears of whiskey in the glass? It could be great. And of course, to explain why those legs, you actually explain this in the book or one of your colleagues, uh, Howard Stone from Princeton explains it. It's all the same thing, really, right? 
Yeah, it is. It's the uh, difference between the surface tension. Um, yeah, I was very fortunate to be able to do some uh, legitimate research with Dr. Stone. Um, he is the complex fluids, yeah, the complex fluids director um, at uh, Princeton University. And he's the one that I reached out to to try and figure out what's causing this. Why are these things forming? One of the nicest guys, unpretentious guys that, that uh, you've ever met. He not only responded to the email, but he's like, eh, we should investigate. You know, and this is a guy that's r running a very important uh, physics lab at, at Princeton. And he was willing to entertain my question and do some research. And we got a, a published research article in a proper physics journal. So, um, yeah, it, it's quite amazing explaining that phenomenon. Very cool. We have a question for Kyle and Nino from Chris Radcliffe. With so much whiskey content out there now, how do you stand out and find what others miss? I know it's hard. I think with the whiskey wash approach, because we have a team of folks doing reviews, it gives us the ability to take in a lot of bottles at once. And then we spread it across our team and every reviewer gets like somewhat of a random mix of things. So there are a few folks that kind of specialize in one or two things, but a lot of folks are generalists. And we're also of the philosophy of we'll review a lot of things. Like we'll talk to very tiny brands and say, you want to send a bottle in? Go ahead. We get the bottles from the big guys. But we're also about, hey, if this is a small distillery in Florida that's producing whiskey and they want to, you know, throw a bottle over to us, we'll check it out because there is so much innovation and product out there these days. We really want to be able to catch as much of it as we can. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking around at the bottom of my collection as well, because I'm going to be giving the exact same answer, which is you just have to take in and try as much as you can. You know, you want to be early on things like a good example, again, with yeah. the um, New Holland Dragon's Milk. You know, I don't I, like I said, I don't always think that these craft uh, breweries, when they distill their beers, I, I've gotten a lot of these. I didn't think tasted good. But here's an example of getting one that I thought tasted very good. You know, you have to taste everything. You have to get out to the events and taste everything. And you, you know, you try to be early on some of these calls. You know, like I, I was writing about the single barrel uh, pick thing years ago before it exploded into the thing that it was uh, this year. And you're not always right. You know, I wrote an article a couple of years back thinking that single barrel tequila was the next uh, big thing. It hasn't really happened out that way. So you have to accept you're going to have a couple of misses along the way as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I got the chance to judge the Texas Whiskey Festival a couple of weeks ago. And it's kind of something we've discovered in doing reviews as well. Some of the smaller brands in different states make outstanding bottlings of things. But because they don't have the money... They don't have the time. Maybe it's only like somebody's part-time gig. They just don't have the reach. Those bottles never get anywhere outside of like, you know, the 15 liquor stores and a 20 mile radius around them plus in the distillery. So the ability to highlight these guys and gals doing these things out there is really an amazing and fascinating part of what we do for a living. Yeah, we always try to be early on these things. Same exact thing. You know, obviously we're reporting on the big guys all the time because that's what drives the news. But yeah, we try to also include some of the smaller uh, distilleries as well, which I mean also speaks to another trend sweeping through the industry right now, which is younger whiskeys tasting better. People are just mm -hmm. better at making it. And it, it doesn't matter if it's not, you know, six, seven years old now. A lot of good stuff mm -hmm. comes out young and it tastes, tastes great. Younger than Tyrone Cote's favorite pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> and as uh, Crump the Cast Cole points it, chill filtration is one of the first signs of the coming of the Antichrist, along with NFTs and the designated hitter. Oh, stop it. Designated hitter made the NL so much better. You want to see pitchers up there taking swings? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about baseball. The Phillies yacked up a six-run lead in the top of the ninth last night to the Mets. Oh, God, that was I'm, atrocious. I'm a Red Sox fan living in Connecticut, surrounded by Yankee fans, including my own wife. Uh, uh, so things aren't too great here either. Are you more in the southern part of Connecticut yes. or more the northern yes, part? Because I feel exactly. like there's a divide. Like, I, I was born in Connecticut, so I kind of know there's a bit of a dividing line. You know, the further north you go, more Boston. The further south you go, more New York. 100%. I'm around New Haven, so I'm down south, and I am in Yankee Town. Let me tell you, it is nothing but Yankee fans around me. It's brutal. Well, not always brutal because they've been better recently, but not this year. 
Crump the Cast Cole says, if you're on the field, you go to bat. He doesn't, he's not buying this. <laughs> you want to see pitchers striking out on three swings and then they run horribly. They get injured. It's it, it, the NL took way too long to get the DH. I think it's about time to uh, jump the shark here and call it a night. Uh, we've, uh, if we're getting down to the point where we're discussing the merits of the designated hitter, we've exhausted our time for tonight. Uh, this is 51 hours, 51 minutes, 23 seconds that you will never get back. That's our Happy Hour Live webcast from the other night, May 6th, 2022, with photographer Ernie Button and writers Kyle Swartz and Nino Kilgore Marchetti. By the way, congratulations to Juan Cruz. He's the winner of a copy of Ernie Button's new book, The Art of Whiskey. Don't forget to join us Fridays at 5 p.m. New York time for our Happy Hour Live webcast. This week, my guest will be the whiskey sponge himself, Angus McRail. If you have comments on this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. Look for me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Once again, thanks to our presenting sponsors, Doers and Redbreast, for making our weekly live shows possible. Along with our segment sponsors each week on WhiskeyCast, Sagamore Spirit, Catoctin Creek, The Dalmore, Scarabus, Mortlock, and Writer's Tears. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.